The first commercial EVA or spacewalk is in the history books, but we should expect more to follow. However, it might not be in the form that you might expect. I want to talk about the only other private individual who purchased an EVA and what we can learn from the successes and failures of past interest in commercial EVAs, as well as what SpaceX's plans are and any future commercial customers on a private space mission who wants to do a commercial spacewalk. We don't have a ton of information to go on, so some of this will be speculative, but it's all based on data and analysis, which is my specialty. I'm Lara Forsick. I'm the executive director of space consulting firm Astrolytical, and I wrote a book on commercial human spaceflight. It has been 59 years since the very first EVA. It has taken all these years for the first commercial EVA. That was the Polaris Dawn mission where two members of their crew exited the vehicle at least most of the way. It wasn't technically a spacewalk in, in guess because they didn't have their legs out. They just sort of lifted their arms, head, torso out of the vehicle for a few minutes and did some tests while two remaining crew members remained inside to monitor the situation. And by all accounts, we don't know, we're not privy to all the details on the SpaceX side, but from the outside, it looks like that EVA went perfectly. Looks like everything worked out. With the new SpaceX spacesuits, the depressurization and repressurization of Dragon, and all of the procedures that they had been practicing for two and a half years leading up to this mission. But as some people have pointed out, this EVA was a bit underwhelming because it was not what we usually think of when we think of spacewalks with astronauts, maybe outside the International Space Station for five, six, eight hours at a time, really working hands on doing something, building something, repairing something, replacing something. That's what we typically think of when we think of an EVA. This SpaceX Polaris Dawn EVA was just a baby step, just really a tech demonstration of the EVA process, the spacesuits, the Dragon, etc. Before I talk about what that Polaris Dawn EVA might be leading up to, I want to talk about the past interest in commercial EVAs, or maybe I should call it private individual EVA. For decades, the only means of private individuals flying to space by themselves, and I'm talking orbital space, on their own dime, was through a company called Space Adventures. They flew the first space tourist, if you want to call him that, Denis Tito, to the International Space Station in cooperation with the Russian space agency Roscosmos. That was in 2001. In 2006, they started advertising that they were offering a commercial EVA in partnership with the Russian space agency. They were offering a one and a half hour spacewalk with a Russian cosmonaut outside the International Space Station for an extra $15 million. And at that time, they were selling their flights to the ISS for $20 million. So not quite double the price, but a good bit of money there if you wanted to add on a spacewalk to your space travel. At that time, they were offering about 10 days on the International Space Station, and $15 million back in 2006 is roughly between 20 to $25 million in today's money. So while that may sound expensive to you and me, there are certainly people who can afford that and would pay that. They signed a customer who did pay a significant amount of millions of dollars to not only travel to the International Space Station, but to also do a commercial spacewalk. He would have been the first private individual to do a spacewalk. This this was Daisuke Inomato, or maybe it's Daisuke Enomato. I forgive me about the mispronunciations. He signed a contract with Space Adventures and paid them $21 million over the course of several months while undergoing training with the Russians for his space flight. You might not recognize his name because he never got a chance to fly. He had chronic kidney stones, and he disclosed this information to Space Adventures. And even though he passed medical screening in Russia to do his flight, Space Adventures denied him the opportunity to do an EVA, and therefore he backed out of the entire space flight. And in 2008, he sued Space Adventures to try to get his money back, saying they breached contract, saying that they had prior knowledge of his medical condition and was happy to take his money, but then did not qualify him for the spacewalk. I was unable to find a resolution to this lawsuit, so I don't know if he won and got any money back or if they settled out of court or what happened here. But he was willing to pay that amount of money, fly to Russia, do the training, learn how to put on the spacesuit, learn how to do an EVA, and got all the way almost to the finish line before he was medically disqualified. And in this particular case, he had no job to do. He would have just been hanging out, presumably, for about 90 minutes, enjoying the view. 
He was replaced by another Space Adventures customer who did not do an EVA. And Space Adventures flew five or six additional people after that who did not sign up to do an EVA. You might think that after that lawsuit, the commercial spacewalk idea would have been on the back burner. It would not have been an option anymore because of all the controversy. However, Space Adventures actually put out a press release in 2020 saying that they were resurrecting the idea. It was essentially the same offering. They were going to offer an hour and a half long spacewalk with a Russian cosmonaut outside the International Space Space Station for an undisclosed amount of money. Space Adventures around this time was saying that they wanted to do that flight in 2023, but it depended on the customer. They didn't have a customer at that time. So if there was a customer who immediately saw that press release and jumped on it, then they can undergo training and fly as soon as 2023. As far as we know, as far as they publicly announced, no customer signed up. And in 2020, Space Adventures cut off its relations with Roscosmos after Russia invaded Ukraine. The commercial EVA, the private EVA through Space Adventures is fundamentally different from what Polaris Dawn did. You can say, and I did say in a recent video, which you can watch after this video linked above, that Polaris Dawn is much more of a tech demo mission, a pioneering mission than it is a space tourism mission. None of these people on board are quote unquote space tourists exactly. They are professionals who are doing a job in cooperation with SpaceX. Two of the crew members are SpaceX employees. So it shouldn't be a surprise that the Polaris Dawn EVA was more of a testing of the equipment and testing of the procedures than enjoying the view. Well, I'm sure they enjoyed the view, for sure. They were doing tests of the mobility of the spacesuits and the ways that the procedure was working from their point of view. They had a job to do, in other words. They were acting more like employees than they were acting like space tourists. However, that doesn't mean that we won't see commercial EVAs in the future that are more space tourist options. There are very few people who are willing to try something out for the very first time. The Polaris Dawn crew, those four people, were those types of people who were willing to try this out for the first time. And now that it has been proven, now that the idea of depressurizing and repressurizing Dragon has been proven, now that the spacesuits have been proven in space, not just in a vacuum on the ground, then we might think that any future customers that are interested in a commercial EVA can think, they tested this. Therefore, it is safe enough for me to try it. So from here, SpaceX can go in two directions and probably will go in two directions. They will very likely go the space tourism route if they have a customer who is willing to pay for just the experience of a commercial EVA. And they have the commercial space servicing route, which is what Polaris number two was trying to do. The Polaris program is envisioned to be three missions. The first one, this one, demonstrating a commercial EVA as well as some other tech demonstrations in there, Starlink, etc. The second one was envisioned to be a Hubble Space Telescope servicing mission. However, after proposals were submitted to NASA and NASA made their decision behind closed doors, I don't think they ever released that report, NASA decided that it was not worth the risk to Hubble Space Telescope to do a commercial EVA. And therefore, at that time, NASA decided that there would be no commercial Hubble servicing mission. They left the door open to change their mind, but I don't think they're gonna change their mind yet, which is a shame because Hubble, Hubble Space Telescope is a national treasure and it is quite old and it really does need another servicing mission to keep on going. However, the concept remains the same. Hubble's not the only telescope out there that can be serviced. There are lots of other telescopes or even space stations that could be serviced by people. When we talk about ISAM, in space servicing, manufacturing, and assembly, I have that slightly out of order, but you know what I mean. When we talk about that, we usually think of robotics. That is where the latest activity, latest innovation has been. However, we have like 50 years of astronauts building, repairing, and servicing in space, starting with Skylab in 1973. There is a long history of astronauts putting on spacesuits, exiting their vehicle, and doing some kind of assembly, repair, replacement, something with a spacecraft or a satellite. And if there are companies that are willing to pay for satellite servicing, which we know there are, then why not have that as an offering that SpaceX can provide? Jared Isaacman was willing to work on Hubble for free. He wasn't asking NASA for money. He wanted to contribute. And in fact, we have seen a pattern now of wealthy individuals paying to go to space and doing work for free because they want to contribute. I did a whole video on that if you want to watch that later. We have seen this with the Axiom customers, the ones that are even not sponsored by government agencies, the private individuals who pay their own way and sign up to do a whole bunch of experiments, research, and spend 
a lot of their time while in orbit doing scientific research for the fun of it to contribute to humanity, contribute to science. They don't need to do that. They could just spend their whole time in space having fun and enjoying the experience, but they want to contribute. And Jared Isaacman is another one who wants to contribute. It's very, very clear. He doesn't want to just go up there for a joyride. He wants to contribute. So I could see it going both ways, where on the one hand, you have professional SpaceX astronauts who are doing a service and SpaceX being paid for that service and those employees being paid for their service up there on the EVA. And I can see it as private individuals who just want to contribute to society. They just want to do something good with their time in space. And therefore, they are willing to not just go on an EVA and stare out at Earth, the beauty of it, but also to go out there and accomplish something. And remember, even though they're starting here with Dragon, and Dragon doesn't have an airlock, which is why they had to depressurize the entire vehicle and then repressurize it, it doesn't need to be that way in the future because we can imagine a future where commercial space stations hire SpaceX for transportation and for satellite servicing, or I should say space station servicing, just like we saw with Skylab in 1973. That's how it started, right? So we can imagine a future where one or more commercial space stations, commercial LEO destinations are hiring SpaceX because SpaceX has the spacesuit, SpaceX has the procedure, SpaceX has the track record. We have only seen the commercial space station companies really mention this in passing about what they plan to do in terms of assembly, repair, modification, servicing of their space stations. Space stations will need to be serviced, will need EVAs, and whether it is an Axiom employee, for example, or a Voyager space employee, or some other employee of the company, or whether they contract SpaceX to do it, or whether they contract private individuals who want to go to that space station, hang out there for a week or two, and while they're on that space station, do a commercial EVA, and just like help out with the repairs. I can totally see a market for that in the future. If you're up there already, and you're already in your spacesuit, you're already taking that risk, you're just going to hang out for a couple of hours, or are you going to do something that said, I contributed to the mission? So as you can tell, a lot of this is speculative because we don't know how accessible this is going to be. We don't know how expensive it's going to be. We don't know how feasible it's going to be. We do have years of experience with government spacewalks to understand the direction that commercial spacewalks could go in. 